שבת, ואני ממש יודעת שאני לא משער את המשך החיים.
Uh, Mr. Armeo. Your Honor, we we'll ask the commission call Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Judge. Please, please rise, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Mr. Armeo, please proceed. Commissioner, I understand that you have a statement you'd like to make? Yes, if you please, I have a prepared statement and obviously available for questions after the statement. Please continue. I want to thank you, Judge Mullen, and the members of the City of New York Commission to investigate alleged police corruption for this opportunity to testify today. I would ask that in addition to testifying, I have the opportunity before you issue your final report to comment in writing and in detail on a number of statements and assertions that were presented in the course of the hearings. Nothing is more important to the successful policing of the nation's largest city than the integrity and credibility of the members of its police department. The corrupt act of even one police officer inflicts incalculable damage on the rest. It undermines pride in the profession and it erodes public confidence in the men and women from whom the people of New York have every right to expect complete honesty and incorruptibility. This is especially true as the police department embraces community policing and enlists the support of people who live and work in the neighborhoods of this city. We can hardly ask the people to join the police in a partnership to combat crime if they have reason to believe that police officers themselves are engaged in it. We can hardly expect the overwhelming majority of honest police officers to take pride in their job in one of the toughest law enforcement environments anywhere in the world if the corrupt police officer easily escapes detection and punishment. The people of New York City must know they can count on the members of their police department to be as honest as they are brave and able. They must know they can count on the police department to track down and drive from our ranks those who violate their oath and break the law. It is fundamental to the honest operation of government that the police be honest. The most renowned of New York City's police commissioners understood this better than most. Police officers, Theodore Roosevelt said, do not merely preserve order, but to a large portion of our population, they stand as the embodiment, as well as the representative of the law of the land. Roosevelt said, no police force is worth anything if its members are not intelligent and honest. And that observation is as true today as when Roosevelt made it nearly a century ago. And a police department soon to exceed 31,000 uniform members, some two and a half times bigger than Chicago's and more than four times larger than Los Angeles, the corrupt police officer is all but inevitable. However, tolerance for the corrupt police officer is neither inevitable nor acceptable. That is why you, Judge Mullen, and your fellow commissioners perform a high public service in examining the extent of corruption in the police department and the extent of the department's failure to combat it. Over the last several months, the police department has supplied the investigative staff of the commission with thousands of files in preparation for these hearings. I'd like to note for the record that your investigators were at all times thorough and professional. And the police department takes pride in the fact that many of them are former members of the department. As familiar as I had become last year with the particulars of the Michael Dowd case, I was revolted nonetheless by the testimony of Dowd and the other corrupt ex-police officers who testified before you. None of them took personal responsibility for their depravity. If Dowd abused alcohol on the job, it was because his supervisor encouraged him to. When he steals the savings of a hardworking woman, it is to win the acceptance of his new partner. Corley beats people, not because he's a thug, but because his sergeant rewards him. The self-serving chorus was always the same. The police department made me do it. Most galling of all was their insistence that they kept quiet about criminal activity they witnessed out of some unshakable bond with their brother officers, rather than the self-serving actions of corrupt hoodlums. Corley claimed he would never betray another cop yet he gladly sold guns to people who could use them to shoot police officers. Beyond their self-confessed acts of thievery, 
extortion, and brutality, the witnesses were offensive in another respect. They tried to paint themselves as typical police officers gone astray. The truth is something else. Most police officers consider Dowd and Cawley and their ilk to be despicable. They are, in the vernacular of the street, lowlifes who deserve to be in prison. Most police officers I know would have locked them up themselves. And most police officers I know were outraged by their posturing. They never should have been police officers in the first place, a subject to which I'll return later in my testimony. As shocking as they were, these witnesses served a purpose in raising legitimate questions as to how they could function unimpeded for as long as they did. They raise questions that bear serious examination as to how well our supervisors are trained and deployed, and whether they are tempted to close their eyes to suspected wrongdoing by officers under their command. These were among the same questions first raised in a series of articles written by columnist Mike McElary in June of 1992. As a result of those stories, I undertook a review of how the Michael Dowd case was mishandled. It is important to know that we responded quickly when these problems surfaced, that we identified them publicly 11 months ago and began the job of correcting them. That process continues today. On November 16, 1992, I reported a number of failures. Those failures are outlined in this report that was published on November 16, 1992. One, the dual system of corruption investigation blurred responsibility and diminished accountability. Two, IAD's ability to determine its own workload was an obstacle to the efficient and effective conduct of investigations. Three, the FIAUs were hampered by a lack of resources and by IAD's dismissive posture toward them. Four, there was a failure to use time-honored investigative techniques to achieve results. Five, IAD lacked a credible case management system. Six, access to important case information was too limited. Seven, the level of staffing for internal investigations was inadequate. Eight, internal investigative units had difficulty recruiting and retaining qualified investigators. Nine, FIAU investigators conducted most corruption investigations but were inadequately trained and were provided inadequate equipment. The central question to emerge from the Dowd case was how could a corrupt police officer identified by the system as a problem, operate with such impunity for so long without being caught by the department. Dowd was not protected as part of some conspiracy or cover-up, but Dowd was not stopped sooner because the anti-corruption system in place was bifurcated and largely ineffective when it came to major investigations. Before a clear, unified chain of command was put in place, Corruption investigations were the responsibility of both IAD and the field internal affairs units. The creation of field internal affairs units in 1972 was well-intentioned. It was intended to fix responsibility for corruption prevention at the command level. That's why the FIAU officers were answerable to separate field commanders, while IAD had oversight responsibilities. The effect was to obscure responsibility rather than reinforce it. <clears throat> in my view, the best way to assure accountability is to make responsibility as clear-cut and unambiguous as possible. In theory, the former IAD would monitor FIAU investigations and run parallel investigations to check on the quality and integrity of their activities. But in fact, very little of either occurred. We found that the field internal affairs unit suffered not only from a lack of IAD oversight support, but from a lack of equipment and personnel. They had caseloads much larger than IADs. IAD itself investigated only 5% of all corruption cases. We found that the FIAUs received little, if any, guidance as to which cases to close and which ones to devote more time to. We also found that there was an over-reliance on random observations of subjects. There was no serious effort to obtain wiretaps in IAD investigations nor was there any serious effort in the Dowd case to turn one corrupt officer against the others. Similarly, there was no serious effort to use undercover officers to help make the case or to establish sting operations or integrity tests. Our inquiry found that with the focus on an individual officer or an individual case, 
opportunities to document patterns of broader criminal activity were missed. We found that information systems and case tracking were weak, and access to both was so limited that, again, patterns of corruption were missed. Beginning in January of this year, 1993, we instituted a major reorganization of our corruption-fighting systems by abolishing both IAD and the FIAUs and creating a single Internal Affairs Bureau headed by Deputy Commissioner Walter Mack, who joined us in May with an outstanding record of prosecutorial experience. Now, for the first time, the internal investigative functions of the New York City Police Department are under the direct supervision of a civilian executive, and he reports directly to the police commission. We also gave the Internal Affairs Bureau first choice among all candidates seeking assignments as supervisors to any investigative arm of the police department. In other words, the career path for investigative supervisors in the New York City Police Department is now through the Internal Affairs Bureau. IAB gets whomever it deems the best, and we are providing these outstanding supervisors with training that we found lacking in the past. We sought out a management consulting firm with a worldwide reputation for excellence, McKenzie and Company, and asked them to undertake a thorough management review of the department's corruption-fighting systems. As a result of the firm's recommendations, we installed new case management and quality control systems. We are obtaining a new state-of-the-art computerized information system to greatly improve the quality of our investigations. We established nine working groups comprised of police department executives and experts from outside the department to address specific areas of concern. They included process and organization, information systems, investigative techniques, personnel selection and career path, training, equipment, physical plant, legal and transition. We initiated weekly steering committee meetings within IAB for the purpose of continual case review, providing for problem solving and reinforcing accountability. We introduced a comprehensive training program for IAB personnel. Working with the Department of Investigation and the Police Department's Detective and Organized Crime Control Bureaus, we developed a model package of equipment for investigative and surveillance teams and spent $2.7 million acquiring it for them. We also introduced a new vehicular fleet for IAB, making unobtrusive lease cars and special surveillance vehicles available to investigators. We are working to reduce backlogs, to close cases without investigative merit, and to build evidence to prosecute all serious cases. While we are determined to move cases efficiently and expeditiously, we are also prepared to devote time and resources to long, complicated cases that merit such attention. McKinsey and company cited the largely reactive management of corruption cases in the past. So we are taking an aggressive posture, putting into play sophisticated sting operations to bring corrupt police officers and others into our net. We are using integrity tests, both targeted tests against officers suspected of corruption, as well as random tests that could reach anyone. If there was ever a reluctance to turn corrupt officers against each other, I do not share it. We will turn them, we, will, we may even give them a chance to redeem themselves in order to bring down the others. We are debriefing drug dealers and confidential informants to determine whether they are aware of any police corruption. We will use criminal informants and we will seek the district attorney's help in doing so. We will make the case for wiretaps and use them. We have examined the times of corruption prone activities and provided additional IAB coverage for midnight to 8 a.m. Also, for the first time, IAB investigators are dispatched as a matter of course to incidents in which a person is shot by a police officer. We have established a special litigation unit to pursue allegations of wrongdoing when they first surface in notice of claims against the city. We are examining any correlation between corruption complaints and complaints of excessive force that are made with the Civilian Complaint Review Board. After listening to the testimony of witnesses and commission staff members, the police department is making every effort to treat people who make corruption complaints, whether members of the department or members of the public, with courtesy and encouragement. Toward that end, we are making the language line uh, translation service available to the IAB action desk. In this way, complainants who do not speak or understand English may have immediate access by telephone to translators on the same line with IAB officers.
to encourage members of the police department as well as the general public to report corruption, we have established a new, easy to remember, toll-free number. It is 1-800-PRIDE-PD. We are also encouraging complainants, police and civilian, to write either to a special IAB postal box, box 1111 in Brooklyn, the zip code is 11201, or personally to me at police headquarters. I want every member of the police department to know that if they have any reservations about reporting corruption to a particular supervisor or commander, they always have the option of going directly to the police commissioner. In testifying about the improvements we have made to our internal investigative systems, I don't want you to conclude that this issue of corruption fighting ends here. Of course it does not. It goes far beyond a reformation of internal affairs or even beyond the problems highlighted by the witnesses before this commission. Beginning with recruitment and training, we have to recognize that our commitment to integrity starts with those we select as probationary police officers and continues with the message we give them through training, both in a police academy and in the field. We have established a committee on police culture to review the selection process for police officers, their training, and other issues, all with an eye towards enhancing an environment or culture that is intolerant of corruption and supportive of efforts to combat it. I have asked the committee to review the questions of maturity and education in determining whether they may be factors in screening out corruption-prone candidates. Considering the enormous responsibility and authority conferred upon police officers, we have to ask ourselves whether the minimum age to become a New York City police officer should be raised. Right now, a candidate for the police department may take the police officer examination at age 16 and a half and be appointed at age 20. Is that too young? Are the educational standards adequate in this day and age? It may be time for the New York City Police Department to raise the minimum educational requirements for a police officer to an associate college degree. We need to do all we can to make certain that police officers feel confident to come forward to report corruption. I am concerned about any ethic that would resist such reporting. We need to pay special attention to our first-line supervisors and their responsibility for integrity control. The transition from police officer to sergeant is difficult and far too quick. There is little opportunity for a new sergeant to assume command with the confidence that further training would afford. Therefore, we are exploring the possibility of establishing a sergeant's academy. It would provide a hiatus between the role of police officer and supervisor and a base for increased training and support. It will also provide an extended opportunity to instill in all sergeants the fact that leadership carries with it the responsibility to impose discipline fairly but unwaveringly. Simultaneously, I have ordered a review of our supervisory staffing models. You have heard testimony about the reported ease with which corruption-minded corruption police officers could elude their supervisors in busy precincts. We need to look at that and determine whether the department should make staffing decisions beyond the standard measure of police officers to sergeant ratios. Right now, we have 297 vacancies for sergeant, and we are awaiting an examination to fill those vacancies. But even then, we have to ask ourselves whether the traditional ratio is enough. Throughout the chain of command, from sergeant on up, we need to exploit every opportunity to make it clear that supervisors and commanders who expose corruption in their own commands will be rewarded, and those who attempt to conceal it will be disciplined. Corruption fighting is like other issues in management. You can be part of the problem or part of the solution. The commitment must be made at the top. And I can affirm to everyone in the police department that no one's career will be diminished if he or she is part of the solution. It can only be enhanced. The police commissioner must be the number one corruption fighter. For that reason, I and my executive staff will be personally involved in the integrity training of the current class in the police academy. 2,600 probationary police officers are in training there, the largest class in history. And we want to make the greatest impression possible, reminding them nothing is more important than their honor and integrity. The police department is a great and strong institution. We can take the so-called bad press. It comes with the territory. 
What we can't afford is anyone who thinks they are doing the department a favor by sweeping problems under the rug. Problems grow there and come back with a vengeance, as these hearings have demonstrated. While I categorically reject the proposition of some of the First Commission witnesses that police officers are somehow trained to practice or accept corruption, I believe the police department bears the responsibility of reinforcing integrity at every turn. We are doing so with revamped police academy curricula as well as in-service training. It is a message that needs to be reinforced throughout a police career, if only because the opportunities for corruption are constant and inherent in law enforcement. To help in that regard, we have convened groups of police officers from various commands and various tours to discuss issues centering on integrity and corruption. The focus groups include union representatives because of the important supportive role they can play in combating corruption. We are also reaching out to the community in new ways. For example, we have established a pilot program that immerses police officers in the dominant cultures of a given police precinct. Language training is part of the program. We have heard throughout the commission hearings references to the wall or code of silence. There is truth to it. There is a solidarity that grows out of the best of intentions and motivations, including the loyalty and sense of mission that binds people engaged in demanding and sometimes dangerous work. But there's a difference between a police officer who says, watch my back, and Michael Dowd's admonition to conceal corrupt activity. In fact, the corrupt police officers who appeared were so self-damning and so good at being anti-role models that their testimony was videotaped by our police academy personnel who have been here filming since the beginning of the hearings. The witness's testimony, along with other portions of the commission's proceedings, will be used in training sessions for new recruits as well as veteran police officers and supervisors. If the Marlin Commission had the distasteful but necessary duty to produce scoundrels as witnesses, you also produced heroes. I concur with you, Judge Mullen, that Sergeant Joseph Tromboli fits that category. I've decided to promote Sergeant Tromboli at the department ceremonies at the end of this month. And no, the timing is not coincidental. In addition to recognizing his obvious talent and dedication as the lone investigator of the Dowd case, we are recognizing his cooperation with and testimony before the Mullen Commission as an act of sterling, lasting service to police officers everywhere. And yes, we are sending a message to all other police officers that Sergeant Tromboli is our definition of a good cop. I have no illusions about the problem corruption poses. Our efforts to combat corruption will produce more painful examples of people who violate their oath and betray their public trust. So be it. Nothing will be swept under the rug. Like other institutions, the police department and law enforcement generally are vulnerable to corruption in a city awash with cash from the illicit drug trade. The morale and good order of the entire police department is at stake, and so is the public's confidence in its police. The police must have the confidence of the public to operate effectively. As painful as I know this process has been to the police officers and other members of the department, I want them and the public to know that it will make for a stronger, revitalized organization. Certainly, that was the case when former Police Commissioner Patrick Murphy took the opportunities created by the Knapp Commission to build a stronger department. But no reorganization, no integrity controls, no matter how well conceived, no matter how able the commissioner who implements them will last forever. Teddy Roosevelt and Pat Murphy could attest to that. And as you have heard in previous testimony, it was a matter of faith that the reforms of the Knapp Commission would work forever. No one really monitored to see if that was so. No one looked to see how well the system performed in light of the crack epidemic of the 80s. As we found in my report on the Dowd case, it turned out to be blind faith. We need to safeguard against complacency and against whatever vagaries, be they crack cocaine or some future unknown condition, conspire against the best of intentions. For that reason, I would favor a formal monitoring process, independent of IAB, but one that preserves the authority 
and the accountability of the police commissioner to conduct investigations and impose discipline, and one that keeps the police commissioner fully informed and involved. To do otherwise is to undermine accountability and to invite a cure worse than a disease. In closing, I want to say how important it is that the police officers of this city know we believe in them. I do. The proudest day of my life came 30 years ago when I took the oath as a New York City police officer. Every day since then, my faith is restored by the men and women I work with and whom I now have the privilege to lead. Judge Mullen said it best when he reported the commission finding that each day throughout the year, the vast majority of police officers throughout the city perform one of society's most important, sensitive, and dangerous jobs with efficiency and integrity. As difficult as I know these last two weeks have been for the members of the police department and the public, I am confident that the commission's faith in this city's police officers is well deserved and widely embraced. As we look ahead, I am also drawn once more to the words of Theodore Roosevelt when he said, there is no good reason why we should fear the future, but there is every reason why we should face it seriously, neither hiding from ourselves the gravity of the problems before us, nor fearing to approach these problems with the unbending, unflinching purpose to solve them aright. Thank you, Judge. Commissioner, on behalf of the Commission, I want to thank you very much for your very broad, your very detailed and excellent statement. I also want to take this opportunity, and I think I can speak on behalf of all the members of the Commission, to congratulate you and to highly commend you for the steps that you've already taken to deal with this very serious, troublesome problem of corruption. I also would hope that the, your statement and the steps that you've taken to deal with the problem will help to restore public confidence and faith in the integrity of the department from the commissioner down. It is so important that the public have faith and integrity and take recognition of the fact that you have alluded to and which I've alluded to as you pointed out, that the overwhelming majority of police officers are honest, incorruptible, and are doing a very difficult and dangerous job every day of the year to protect the lives, the safety, property of the people of the city of New York. And I want to commend you very much. I think that the steps you have, ha have taken are very important, and we look forward to seeing the implementation of the other steps and the measures that you've indicated in your statement. So again, Thank on behalf you. of the Commission, and I also believe very strongly on behalf of the people of this city, I want to thank you. I also want to take recognition of the fact that you've promoted Sergeant Tromboli, not because we take as a matter of personal satisfaction and he cooperate with us, but as you pointed out in your statement, the sending of a message is so important, and that message to the members of the police department, that those who exert every effort to combat corruption, to root it out of the department, are worthy of commendation and where appropriate promotion. And I think that's a very important message to give to the members of your department. So I thank you, thank and you, I congratulate Judge. you for that as well. Thank you. Mr. Mayo, you may. <clears throat> Commissioner, I, I wonder, you very candidly recognized in your statement um, a number of the failures within the Internal Affairs Division. I was wondering if you might venture an opinion as to why that was allowed to persist for such a long period of time. I think that uh, over time, a uh, attitude of complacency did develop. But as my report showed, I think uh, there was a significant structural defect in the bifurcated system, where you had the Sergeant Trombolis of FIUs uh, working diligently, but essentially being unsupported, uh, didn't have the equipment, uh, didn't have the training to do um, a an appropriate job. Uh, so if I had to pick out one reason, it was the structure that was put in place in the early 70s uh, and then I think allowed to degenerate from there in terms of attention, in terms of focus, in terms of, uh, of equipment. Uh, but I would also say that there was uh, an attitude of, of complacency or lethargy in the department as far as uh, corruption fighting was concerned uh, during the 80s. 
Let me see if I understand you. In other words, you think that the philosophy of the bifurcated system somehow had the opposite effect of being an effective corruption detector because there was an answering to two different command structures within the department. Right. I, I'm not certain that that was the reason for the philosophy, if you will, but clearly the dual system was not effective in, in handling the vast majority of cases. If you've pointed out, and I pointed out in my statement, 5 percent of the corruption cases were handled by the Internal Affairs Division, and the other 95 percent of misconduct corruption cases handled by field internal affairs units, uh, simply not able to carry out that workload, didn't have the, the proper resources to do it. So what I'm saying is there was, I think, an attitudinal problem, but in addition, a structural uh, problem as well. Under your centralized system, how can we be assured that the sense of command accountability, which was the underlying ph philosophy of the Murphy reforms back in the 70s, will persist. Will commanders out in the field say, hey, there's a new beefed up IAB out there and it's their job to find the corruption, not mine? No, commanders will be held accountable, but they'll be held reasonably uh, accountable. They'll be held for mismanagement and corruption and, and the festering of corruption is mismanagement. So they're going to be held accountable, but not uh, mindlessly hacking and slashing, as has happened through the years in the department, uh, where as a message to others, perhaps uh, people who were responsible and other people who were not responsible were hurt in this kind of avalanche of, of retribution. Uh, so I certainly will hold commanders accountable, and certainly my successor, uh, I, I think anyone in this position uh, has to make a commitment to holding uh, managers uh, accountable. And I don't see any uh, commander saying that they don't have the means to uh, fight the uh, corruption. We have put in place in each location where we had FIAUs previously, the 19 FIAUs, we have put inspections units, but granted they're for low-level uh, violations. They are clearly not for corruption. Corruption to me means the allegation of a crime. So I, I imagine then for the detection of corruption on the, the system that you implemented, the primary accountability will be on commanders of IAB, the Internal Affairs Bureau. Well, there's a responsibility on everyone's shoulders, certainly managers, certainly supervisors, to identify and uh, uh, notify uh, internal affairs, their superiors, of of uh, corrupt activities. But as far as corruption investigations, we now have a clear channel of accountability. You have the now a civilian deputy commissioner in charge of all internal investigations, certainly all criminal internal investigations, reporting directly to the police commissioner. What you had previously is this somewhat confused uh, system where there were, they were reporting to dual, this is the FIAU uh, uh, units, reporting to dual masters, if you will. And I think that uh, diffused responsibility uh, really uh, created uh, much of our, of our problems. But the investigation of corruption allegations is clearly now in the purview of the Internal Affairs Bureau. And clearly, we now have a, a clear chain of authority and accountability in that regard. We've had a lot of testimony before the commission about sort of built-in reluctance that police commanders have to report corruption, essentially because they see it as a threat to their career rather than a badge of honor. Do you think you've turned that around with your reforms? I hope so. I think uh, uh, my message has been clear, but it's something that constantly has to be reinforced. We certainly don't want to sweep anything under the rug, as I said in my prepared remarks come back to haunt us with a vengeance. So the message to managers, to supervisors, is to put everything out uh, in the open. Uh, that careers can only be enhanced by doing that, certainly not diminished. So in other words, as I understand you to say, if for an in, in take a hypothetical, there were a precinct-wide problem um, in a particular precinct, and the commanding officer of that precinct either knew or had reason to know that this corruption existed, 
Would that fall within your definition of reasonable accountability? If you're saying it reason to know, absolutely. Would this commander be able to say, well, I did what I could do to prevent it, and after all, Commissioner, you've just beefed up a new centralized IAD who's supposed to be everywhere and anywhere. Shouldn't the accountability also fall on that group in IAB, perhaps, um, who was investigating the corruption in that precinct? Perhaps. It depends on the individual case. Do you believe institutionally, as we've heard in the testimony before us, that the Internal Affairs Division, this is before your reforms, let's talk about that period of time, did indeed have an institutional reluctance to pursue aggressively wide-scale corruption? I don't know. The, the Dowd case was a, a classic mishandling of a corruption investigation, but IED's involvement in the Dowd case, obviously it should have been much greater, but it was minimal. Uh, and that's the most glaring um, case that we see out there, the most glaring error. Um, I, it's difficult for me to say that. I was under the impression, quite frankly, that they were aggressively uh, pursuing uh, corruption cases, and the Dowd investigation, the one that I conducted, was an eye-opener to me. So it's difficult for me to characterize, uh, though I know there's been testimony uh, to that extent, of a, like a general reluctance to go forward with an investigation because somehow the department will be uh, embarrassed. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you have an opinion about the evidence given by Lieutenant Hodling and other people who have appeared before the commission privately that IAD had a propensity in certain cases to deliberately fragment allegations, send them out to the field, so to speak, piece by piece, so that the department would not have to be confronted by another 77th precinct scandal. Do you find there's any veracity to that testimony? I would say it's possible. I, I don't have any knowledge or sense of that. The, the case that I am most familiar with, of course, is the Dowd case. And, and that didn't happen, in my judgment, in the Dowd case. That was a question of these individual allegations coming in against Michael Dowd. The first couple of allegations were handled at the FIAU level, and then, almost as a matter of convenience, they continued to be uh, assigned to the FIAU, rather than somebody stepping back and taking a look at it in the aggregate and saying, this is a bad actor and we have to at least IED, take, take back this, this case. But, Commissioner, you'll remember Sergeant Trimboli did just that. He went to the IAD uh, in that March of 89 meeting with his commanding officer of the FIAU to present to the IAD, in fact, the total picture of what all the, the sum of all the allegations, so to speak. And I'm wondering whether or not, in the course of your investigation of the Dowd matter, you ask yourself the question why, at that point, IAD wasn't willing to put a team together and go out and look at the 7-5 precinct, especially in light of the fact, sir, that it was going on contemporaneously with and immediately after probably the biggest corruption scandal that the department has faced since the NAP days. You know, that, that's a good question. Uh, my sense was he was not refused assistance to fragment the, the case. It was a combination maybe of, of laziness. I think some of the the meetings that, that he had, at least initially, were with low-level people in, um, in IED, relatively low-level low supervisors in IED. If you're asking me, do I think that's the, the reason why the Dowd case was a left, allowed to kind of flounder in FIUs to diffuse uh, responsibility or to prevent embarrassment from the department, yes. my answer is no. It's not my belief. Commissioner, what if I may. And the structure that you have put into place or are still putting into place, do you contemplate that you would, you personally, as police commissioner, would get periodic reports from your deputy commissioner, Mr. Mack, with regard to corruption cases uh, within the IAB? We meet every day on uh, corruption cases, on ongoing investigations, and I meet with other uh, chiefs uh, as well. But certainly, as far as the uh, area of corruption is concerned, uh, cases are discussed every day with me. So you haven't had a chance probably to view the testimony of today, but just before you uh, testified, uh, Commissioner Ward was here, 
And he said he never heard of Michael Dowd when he was police commissioner. For all those years that Dowd was operating, so apparently, openly, notoriously, Commissioner Watts said he never heard of him. And um, what we are concerned about, of course, is that no, not you nor any other future commissioner will ever be in that position and have that problem, not hearing about activities such as Officer Dowd was engaged in during those days. We have many ongoing investigations. Obviously, in the organization our size, we're going to have a considerable volume of internal investigations. But uh, certainly not a case of the scope of the magnitude of, uh, of Dowd uh, would escape uh, scrutiny today. Yeah. Commissioner Ward also um, uh, ascribed uh, some of the uh, problem uh, with respect to uh, uh, the Dowd matter as coming from the um, various or fragmented uh, allegations to which I, I think you've alluded, but I, I just want to be clear that at least hereafter, so far as you can see and have envisioned it, that possibility will never happen, uh, never come to be again. That is, all the allegations will somehow come together rather than, uh, although I think Commissioner Ward oversimplified it, but uh, rather than being in different places at different times so nobody ever had the whole bag before them. Well, they clearly come together in one unit. Now, one of the problems with the Dowd case is there was literally no way of, well, there was a way, but it was an ineffective way of doing name checks to see if uh, similar names showed up in, in uh, other investigations or even Dowd's name showing up because it was a very compartmentalized approach. What we will shortly be doing is putting in place a, an information system uh, with proper security safeguards that will enable a whole series of cross-references and cross-checkings uh, to take place so that uh, Clearly, a system will be in place, is in place now, but will be automated and computerized, hopefully by December, that will allow that uh, to happen with great facility. Thank you. Well, I'm a little puzzled. My recollection of Sergeant Tromboli's testimony, that he had personal knowledge of all of these facts, and that he constantly went to his superior, that he went to IAD with all these facts, made an appeal to the, his superior in IAD and, and appealed to them to take the Dow case. So it seems to me that you didn't need any systems because you had an individual who had all the information. He went to a superior individual who uh, <coughs> made a, a decision that apparently uh, frustrated uh, uh, Sergeant Tremboli's investigation. Yep. You what had, would happen in a case like You that? had IAD in a position in those days to say to Sergeant Tromboli, go back to the FIAU, go back to your borough commander and get additional resources. We're strapped for people too, whether that was right or wrong. That was the answer that was given. And it was, at least in theory, acceptable because of this dual system that we had. That Sergeant Tromboli, no, it could not. But okay. Sergeant Tromboli reported to the borough commander, a uniform borough commander. That's who he worked for. I see. IAD only had in those days staff supervision. But uh, this was a little, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the fact is that it was a little more complicated than that, uh, Commissioner. As I understand it, at or about that time, another officer came to uh, uh, Sergeant Stromboli and said, uh, would you be good enough to undertake a separate and different investigation, essentially diluting the time uh, and energies that he could uh, devote to, um, to the Dowd case. I, I just want to be sure that yep. all of these concerns, which I know you're spending lots and lots of time on, and I, I share the Chairman's view that, that you certainly have devoted a lot of time to this. I just think we are anxious that as much of these problems or as many of these problems are resolved as possible. And, and that's just one of them that I would, would like to think you've somehow uh, uh, got a finger in the, in the dike to prevent. Sure. That situation just underscores the difficulty with this dual system that was in place. Sergeant Tromboli, in 1989, is directed, asked by his borough commander, who he works for, to look at another precinct, and at least potentially taking time away from the 75th precinct investigation. That's not the case any longer. The internal investigations are done in the Internal Affairs Bureau. So you it doesn't, say the does not report. Care. 
to two masters, if you will. Mr. Mayor. Commissioner, I was just asking you a moment ago whether or not in your investigation into the Dowd matter you ever detected either any deliberation or willful blindness with regard to corruption detection, especially when, in fact, the road led to precinct-wide or large-scale corruption. And you answered that you hadn't in the Dowd matter. I wonder, in light of the Commission's revelations about the Alan Brown matter, and in light of other investigations, which I believe I know you're aware about, in the uh, Brooklyn North FIAU, where the same kind of thing seems to happen, that is, the serious cases come in piecemeal to IAD, IAD piecemeal sends them out to FIAUs, which IAD knows lack personnel, lack resources, lack equipment. So when Dowd becomes less of an aberration, do you as police commissioner begin to suspect that perhaps the system did have some sort of built-in reluctance that was acted upon in order to uncover wide-scale corruption? It's certainly possible. Uh, I would hope that the signal is clear that uh, that will be no longer uh, tolerated. But is it possible in those cases? It's possible. Well, how can we assure that after the tenure of Raymond Kelly and the tenure of Walter Mack, that that kind of notion about corruption doesn't reappear? Well, I think, as I've said, I, I think our record in the last 10 years probably uh, justifies uh, some sort of outside uh, monitoring. That's one way of doing it. But clearly, anybody who takes this job, that's one of the criteria, that's one of the basic tenets that has to be uh, put to any potential candidates to be uh, uh, a police commission. It has to be, uh, I think, our number one focus because it's the foundation on which we do everything else. We're talking about community policing. We need confidence on the part of the people. Uh, as I said in my prepared remarks, probably always going to have some corruption uh, problems in an organization uh, this size. But the, the message, I think, is clear, hopefully from me and, and certainly from anyone who succeeds me, that uh, we have to have sunlight on, on these problems. We have to expose them, and we will be a stronger, better organization uh, for it. We agree. It's just that I just wanted to ask you whether or not we also agree that we should um, have some sort of an institutional guarantee that that will continue in the future? Well, I, I think uh, there are probably no guarantees in life. All these systems are all going to be driven by people and with the vagaries and weaknesses of, of uh, human nature. So I don't think there is any such thing as a guarantee. And I think perhaps, uh, to a certain extent, some people thought that our internal investigation system was put on automatic pilot as a result of the NAP commissions. And it required uh, constant vigilance and uh, attention, and something that, quite frankly, didn't happen over a long continuum, over at least uh, 18 years or so. So I don't know if there is a guarantee. Uh, I think it's something that certainly commission hearings like this, certainly embarrassments for the department uh, like this, should uh, uh, be kept fresh in the minds of uh, my successors. I gather you would agree that at least two imperatives in terms of dealing with this problem are, one, a total sense of commitment on the part of the police commissioner, and secondly, a, an implementation of the principle of accountability right through the entire chain of command. Would you agree that absolutely. those two are absolutely I, I, Those are absolutes, uh, Judge, in this business. One of the um, statements that the chairman made in his opening remarks was that corruption is something that has to be fought on all fronts every day within the department, which is, I assume, a statement that you agree with. One of the points that has been made to me is that in your reform of the anti-corruption apparatus of the police department, that you've placed a very heavy concentration on investigations, on beefing up the capacity to investigate, um, on assuring good relationships with the local district attorneys and other prosecutors. 
You've talked a bit in your statement about other reforms that you intend to make. What I'd like to know is how do you as a commissioner ensure out there in the hinterland, in Brooklyn North or in Manhattan North, that sergeants aren't looking the other way, that ICOs are in fact doing their job rather than giving cops a heads up that IAB is in the precinct. What can you possibly do about that? Well, I think it, it gets back to training issues. It gets uh, back to the issue of emphasis from the top. In a lot of word, ways, uh, personal involvement of myself and, and commanders, but it also uh, gets to the issue of effective investigations because we can use carrots and, of course, we, we always need a stick in this business. And I think uh, uh, we are now configured in a much more effective way to do uh, internal in investigations. And I think uh, that message uh, is out there uh, already. So it's a, it's a combination of training, emphasis, and, of course, the ability to uh, uh, conduct internal investigations. Will you continue the Integrity Control Officer program? I'm sorry. Will you continue the ICO, the Integrity Control Officer program? I think it has merit. It has value. I was uh, an Integrity Control Officer many years ago. Uh, we have recently looked at the program. Uh, it's kind of a consensus of the people that I had look at it, the chiefs of the department, that it's been bogged down with uh, too much paperwork. We have a tendency to pile a lot of administrative duties, not only on ICOs, but also sergeants on patrol. And these are things that uh, uh, we are uh, looking at. But I think the program has merit, and I intend to keep it. One of the frustrations when we did our inquiry into the uh, Integrity Control Officers programs that the ICOs who came before us, Commissioner, had was that the IAD basically wanted nothing to do with them. That instead of being the eyes and ears of the anti-corruption actors for the department, uh, they were uh, treated as pariah. Any way you have about hooking up the ICOs with IEB and making the ICOs an integral part of the process? Well, I think they should be. They receive and have in the past, uh, the question is what the quality is, but they, or was, they receive training from uh, IED. I think that should continue. That should be expanded. And I think there, there should be much more of a partnership, uh, a closer feeling of, of teamwork between ICOs, of which we have uh, literally uh, over 100 in the department. They can be a valuable source of information. They can be a valuable uh, asset to commanders. And uh, I know I had uh, integrity control officers that worked for me, extremely helpful, and I believe I was too to the commanders I, I worked for. So it's a, a program that I think needs some reinforcement, needs to be uh, uh, examined, but I, I would submit that uh, it is doing some good and probably can do a lot more good. What about the size of precincts? I'm sorry, what? The size, the geographical size of precincts. Are you looking into that? Do you think uh, when, when you say looking at the geographical size of precincts, I assume you're talking about uh, for supervisory purposes? Yes, or? sir. Um, I think it's really a resource issue, not so much the size of the precincts, but the resources you devote to a precinct. And that's what we're looking at, the staffing models. Uh, you've heard testimony here, and, and, and uh, it's true that particularly in busier uh, commands, uh, sergeants are tied up uh, rather quickly in the tour, and then there is in fact, uh, lack of supervision for extended periods of time. So we are looking at staffing models, supervisory models, at least for some of the busier commands in the, in the precinct that greatly exceed or significantly exceed what they are uh, today. I'm that score commissioner, and I, I'm not sure it's fair to burden you with as many of our problems as we can um, uh, get out, but one of the um, uh, problems that did bother me, and uh, which uh, uh, our council has now touched and you've responded, is the testimony that officers with um, um, allegations of one sort or another against them, um, perhaps infractions, perhaps civilian complaints, um, seem to be um, transferred or, in one witness's uh, language, dumped into some of the precincts with the highest crime rate uh, and with the need for the best and uh, most proficient police officers. And I wondered whether or not uh, you've looked at this, whether it seems like something you should look at further, 
or whether it just uh, doesn't deserve any um, uh, further attention because it just isn't so. No, it's a tendency that we've had in the past uh, to do that. And we are uh, looking at that. There are only 75 precincts. Uh, the question of, 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 of course, where you assign um, uh, people, for instance, some of the people who testified here uh, complained that they were assigned to some of these uh, commands right out of the police academy. That's, that's going to happen. I think you're talking about disciplinary cases that are transferred from one unit to another. They shouldn't be allowed to pile up in one uh, particular precinct. We're looking at that. Uh, it's something that, that should not be allowed uh, to happen. And uh, there are some commands now that have probably uh, an inordinate number of disciplinary uh, problems. Is there any review of transfer of officers? Who has the authority to transfer an officer or to approve a transfer? And is there any review of that process? Well, there, there, of course, there are administrative uh, transfers. Say administrative transfers. There's, there's also a pejorative term, administrative transfer. But I mean the normal transfers that occur. Uh, that normally goes through our chief of personnel. But the authority to transfer and to promote lies with the police commissioner. That's delegated to, to the chief of personnel. Mayor, anything further? Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything further? Yes, I would like to. Uh, okay. Commissioner, uh, at the beginning of your commendable statement, and indeed at the end, you suggested that uh, for the last two weeks, that we've been preoccupied by listening to outrageous rogue cops personified by people like uh, Dowd, Cawley, Urell, and so on and so on. And indeed, uh, hero cops like Sergeant Tromboli. Have you been able in your busy days to uh, uh, consider the testimony of Kevin Hembury, who appeared here? Some of it, not all of it. As I understood Hembury, and um, this leads me to a question, Hembury did not take the view that this, his crimes, his uh, uh, letting down of the department, etc., were the fault of his brother officers at all. In fact, he was quite eloquent, if not poignant, in suggesting that the fault lay on him. And that's why I think you were uh, correct when you suggest that there's more to be done than simply to beef up, as you've already put in place, your investigative techniques, strengthening command structure, and so on. But there is a serious problem, it seems to me, about somebody who's not a hero and not a rogue. And after all, as you well know, in your experience in the uh, Marine Corps and police department. Uh, life is made up mostly of people who are neither rogues nor heroes. And it seems to me that I am delighted, and I want to ask you, though, about further consideration of methods of recruiting and training, and indeed helping having commanders help some of these young policemen. You get the sense from listening to Hembury that he really felt lost. And he was sort of between the rock and the hard place because he wasn't getting any training. He wasn't getting any support from his brother officers. He didn't lay it all on them, I uh, hasten to add. But I think that maybe we've concentrated a little too much in the last week on the rogues and maybe not enough on the in-between people, most of whom I think are totally honest or start out that way. And I uh, commend to your attention and to... Let me tell you what we have in the department. We have 3,000, almost 3,000 sergeants, 1,100 lieutenants, yeah. uh, 300 captains, uh, and then about 100 and so people above that. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about in the field, uh, I mean, they, they do a myriad of I think of, that of must things. be where they were talking about, in the field. Each precinct would have anywhere from 20 to 28, 30 sergeants five, six, seven lieutenants, depending on the size of the precinct, one or two captains. Uh, oh. That's the structure in right. uniform. Well, then that, that, accepting that, it seems to me that one thing that is at least implicit in the evidence we've heard is that there was very little concern among these supervisors or commanders for what was going on in the lives of the younger officers. And I'm sure you know that and are aware of that, but uh, that's one reason I was particularly interested in the last part of your statement, 
because I think those are important things, uh, just as the other things which you are putting into place. The second and last area I would like to ask you about is this. As you know, and we all know here, that before these hearings even began, it was said in the press and elsewhere that this commission had already made up its mind to come up with either an inspector general idea or um, more special prosecutors and so on. And of course, as you know, you've focused on that and spoken about it. But I think the fact simply is that the commission has not made up their mind, or at least if they have, I'll have to complain to my chairman. Uh, one of the things that struck me about your statement is, and I saw this in the press, that you would use the services of McKinsey & Co. to give some management ideas. Is that so? We did. We used them. Yeah. One helpful. of the things I'd like to ask you, sir, is an idea that we, we did uncover in our private sessions with uh, police officials and others, was the concept of a civilian commission of a very small nature. In fact, one suggestion was that we have two or three unpaid persons, uh, such as the Mollen commissioners. After all, we don't want to serve forever because we're not paid, and we have to make a living. But to get some three, say, citizens who could do an audit function in respect to anti-corruption efforts at the department, but I would also suggest, to, and I would ask you indeed, whether or not you wouldn't welcome that sort of a concept so long as there's no attempt to undermine the commissioner's disciplinary authorities, or any of his authorities, really, but to help him in management. Because that's really what that kind of a, an apparatus would do. And that the, this group would report to the commissioner, perhaps also to the mayor, and not constantly be monitoring, I don't mean that, but uh, some way being brought into uh, activity from time to time so that you would have their advice, perhaps, on subjects not only about anti-corruption activities, but other activities, morale, training, uh, realigning structures, perhaps. Does that seem to you to be a, at least plausibly worthwhile device to think about? I, I would say it's plausible. Of course, I'd like to see, I'm waiting for a recommendation oh, to come from the commission. Obviously, before I, but I, I'm I trying react, to reach. I think that's plausible. I'm yes. trying to reach out because we're told so often that we're always thinking about an IG or a special prosecutor or something. Uh, I don't think that's what we're doing, but we're still groping, and that's why I'm asking. You yourself in this statement tend to suggest toward the end that you wouldn't mind some sort of outside apparatus like this. Yes, I agree. As long as the department and the police commissioner uh, continues to uh, uh, affect discipline oh, yes. and to uh, be able to conduct investigations. Surely. It has to be kept as a player in the system. And initially, when we were talking about an IG or was in the papers, it seemed to imply an organization external from the department that would do investigations and, and, and essentially let the police commissioner off the hook. And that's not... Uh, well, I don't and I think, think you, you've, you've come, at least if I... Uh, some of the statements that Judge Mullen uh, has made, uh, that's certainly not the position that the, that the commission No, no, I don't think anybody with. that I've heard of in this commission has thought of something like that. Well, there's a lot what of speculation What I do think we press. think about, though, is that there should be somebody who is not in the police department. But that doesn't mean that this should be a, some sort of a operation flying in the sky and spending tons of money to tell you what to do every day. What it does mean, though, is thinking of things that would really help you and the department as a management tool. And that's why the McKinsey reference interested me. Well, they were extremely helpful. And, well, I'm uh, sure they were. But uh, one of the things that I think we are trying to grope with is there are all manner of things that could be done 
but I think we are also concerned with not doing anything to intrude upon the disciplinary powers of the commissioner of the New York City Police Department or indeed on his supervisory and management functions as the senior official. And it's that well, perhaps we can continue this dialogue once the hearings are over and we come to a more uh, critical time to put our report in place and deal with this issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I think, well, I'd like to note for the record, too, the presence of Deputy Commissioner Walter Mack, who's the Deputy Commissioner in charge of uh, uh, leading all efforts to combat corruption within the department. Um, and I'd also like to say at this time, Commissioner, we thank you very much for your testimony. I think by your testimony, and perhaps even more importantly, by the things you're doing and will continue to do, that you will accomplish three all-important objectives, at least these three. One, you are well on the way, it appears to me, to devising a far more effective means of combating corruption and ferreting, it, ferreting it out within the department. Secondly, I would hope very fervently that by your testimony, by the things you're doing, you will have a very positive impact on the morale of the members of the department. And thirdly, that you will also have a major impact in restoring public faith and confidence in the integrity of the department. So we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now recess for 10 minutes. We'll resume at 10 minutes to 4. May we ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Chairman, I ask the Commission call Professor Mark Moore. Professor Moore, you please rise. Raise your right arm. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please be seated, Mr. Armeo. Professor, what's your occupation? I'm a professor of criminal justice policy and management at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Are you employed by this commission? Uh, I am. I'm employed as an academic consultant to this commission. And how long have you acted as this commission's academic consultant? Um, I think since uh, March of this last year. Do you please describe just briefly your background and experience in the field of criminal justice management and policy? Well, let me concentrate um, my response there on what I've done in the field of policing. Um, in the past, I've uh, worked with the New York City Police Department. I was on the Philadelphia Police Study Task Force, which reviewed uh, the Philadelphia Police Department in the wake of a corruption scandal and a disastrous tactical operation against an organization called MOVE. Um, I have worked at length with the New South Wales Police Department in Australia in helping them uh, manage a tr transition uh, from a corrupt police department into one, a department that is uh, focused on uh, community policing uh, without corruption. So I have extensive background in the police field. And Your Honor, for the record, I would like to acknowledge that Professor Moore is a nationally and internationally renowned expert in the field of police management and police corruption. Professor Moore, I know that you've been following the evidence with regard to the extent and nature of corruption facing the New York City Police Department today and have been at this commission's request studying various alternatives for institutional reform to help root out and prevent the problem in the future. Have you come to conclusions regarding your studies in this area? Uh, I have and with your permission I'd like to be able to present them today. Yes, please continue. 
Unfortunately, or my task, as uh, Mr. Romeo indicates, is to initiate this discussion of what should be done to deal more effectively with the kinds of corruption and misconduct that have been revealed through the work of the Mullen Commission and others. Being an academic, I can only get to these conclusions by taking the long way around the barn. So bear with me for a few minutes while I try to put the problem and the possible solutions in a somewhat broader context that includes the broader history of New York and other national and international efforts to deal with the problem. For those of you who can't wait for me to get to my conclusions, however, let me state these now and again later. First, I am convinced that some form of independent agency should be created that can keep the public's and the police department's attention focused on the problem of police corruption and misconduct. Second, to ensure that the ultimate authority and accountability of the police commissioner is not abridged, I think that external agency's predominant, perhaps exclusive, responsibility should be to audit the police department's performance in controlling corruption. It should not try to substitute for or compete with the department's own efforts to investigate corruption. The police department is the agency responsible for controlling corruption. The job of the external agency would be to warrant the broader to the broader public the quality of the efforts being made by the department. Third, with respect to the internal arrangements within the police department for controlling corruption and misconduct, I believe it is important that operational commanders continue to have the responsibility and the means to control corruption in their commands. This system of decentralized responsibility and accountability is essential to reclaiming the cultural commitment of the police department as a whole for those who resist corruption rather than those who tolerate it. It achieves this result by engaging much of the formal and informal powers of the department's hierarchy in quite visible, tough actions that show their intolerance of corruption, rather than leaving these acts to others. Fourth, to make this system of command accountability work, it is important that the central elements of the Internal Affairs Bureau make extensive use of investive, aggressive investigative methods, not just to develop evidence in cases where allegations have already been made, but also to try to develop new leads and to probe for corruption in places where no allegations yet exist. The findings of this central unit can be used as the basis for discussion with operational commanders about the quality of their efforts to deal with corruption in their local commands. Fifth, it is also important that the overall investigative capability focused on allegations of police corruption and misconduct, whether conducted centrally or by operational commanders, be substantially upgraded. It ought to be possible to link cases from one to another to help the department find the, quote, dangerous offenders, close quote, among the police as well as among the criminal offenders. As a matter of principle, the police department ought to be as aggressive and as fair in investigating its own officers as it is in investigating citizens accused of serious crimes. Finally, it is important to improve the department's ability to use the complaint processing system, not only to initiate investigations, but also as the basis for more aggregate analyses of the department's vulnerability to corruption and misconduct and the adequacy of its systems for controlling corruption over the long run. Those are my conclusions. Now let me tell you how and why I have reached these conclusions. The last time the public got a close look at corruption within the New York Police Department and the department's efforts to deal with it was about 20 years ago in the Knapp Commission's hearings. At that time, the corruption problem looked somewhat differently than it does today, or at least it was framed somewhat differently. No doubt at the time, there were instances in the police department of police officers using their positions to commit crimes such as theft, drug dealing, assault, and so on, as we've heard testimony about here. Yet the Knapp Commission focused public attention on a different piece of the corruption problem. They focused it on the problem of gambling pads, and they focused on police officers that they described as grass eaters, rather than focusing on extortionate types of activity they called stings, and the very aggressive uh, officers that they described as meat eaters. They focused the public's attention on this piece of the corruption problem, which you might think of as the lesser but larger piece of the corruption problem, for two reasons. First, in many ways, this was the larger and more shocking portion of the problem they encountered. What was shocking about this piece corruption problem was not that it 
was that it was pervasive organizationally and supported. More officers were involved, so were superior officers, so the behavior seemed normal and people were routinely recruited into the corrupt networks. That was a shocking indictment of the state of the um, normal character of life in the police department. Second, and I think this was almost as important in their thought, the Knapp Commission believed that it was the pads and the grass eaters that made it very difficult for the department to get at the stings and the meat eaters that were going on simultaneously. For the complicity of the department, of many in the department, in these lesser forms of corruption, prevented the department as a whole from taking effective action against the officers who were the worst offenders. So they thought it was at least necessary and perhaps sufficient in seeking to control corruption to clean up the pads so that they could get at the, at the more other more serious instances of corruption. Patrick Murphy, the newly appointed commissioner, used the leverage supplied by the Knapp Commission's pressure to make important reforms in the New York Police Department, how New York Police Department dealt with corruption. He established the principle of command accountability and organized and the, operated the department to make it an urgent and vital theme in the department's office, operations. Specifically, he changed the mission and task of the central IAD unit. He changed it from having the principal responsibility for conducting the central investigations to uh, checking on the ambient conditions in operational commands, looking for evidence of corruption there that could be used as the basis for discussion with operational commanders uh, about whether they had taken aggressive actions to deal with uh, corruption in their command. He authorized and encouraged the use of the most aggressive investigative techniques available to the department. In, in seeking to investigate corruption, including electronic surveillance, the use of informants, and the use of turnarounds. He worked on improving the methods of personnel selection and training, and he altered police operations to make them more resistant to corruption, including taking the police department out of some potentially corrupting businesses, such as gambling enforcement and street-level drug enforcement. In this set of actions, Commissioner Patrick V. Murphy set an industry standard for departmental efforts to control corruption that remains important today. He also seems to have been effective in knocking out the organized corruption pads, both then and perhaps continuing through today. As the work of the Milan Commission has made clear, however, these forms were not successful in eliminating corruption and serious misconduct forever. Moreover, the world has changed in some crucial respects since the days of the Knapp Commission. The pressure on police corruption from the public has abated, at least until recently. The country has faced an epidemic of cocaine use that made it imperative that the police go back into the business of street-level drug use as one tactic in dealing with the epidemic. And the city has begun shifting the department to a strategy of community policing. Uh, so those are the important changes that have occurred. The challenge then, faced initially by the Mullen Commission, and now through the aegis of these hearings, the city at large, are these. One, how to go further than Knapp Commission and Patrick Murphy could go in rooting out corruption and misconduct and making the gains even more permanent. Two, how to deal with the new forms of corruption that have become prominent today. Three, how to integrate corruption control efforts with the new philosophy of community policing and use the strengths of community-oriented policing to help deal with those particular new problems. Let me start by talking about the new forms of corruption. What we see in the hearings, the form of corruption that we see revealed through these hearings looks different than what we saw in the Knapp Commission. The good news is that it seems that a smaller fraction of officers are involved, but it does still occur in many places and involves more than one or two officers. Good news is also that it has less organizational support for the effort. It does not yet appear that there are any superior officers directly involved in supporting the corruption. There is less of a carte blanche for offenders. The officers are still trying to arrest uh, offenders, uh, but are doing so to extort money. That's all the good news about the corruption problem. The bad news is that the individual incidents we see are much worse, uh, more vicious, more destructive of relationships between the police department and the community than those we saw in the past. That, however, turns out to potentially be a piece of good news as well, because it may be that that form of corruption 
is easier to uh, control than the forms that we've seen in the past. From the point of view of individual police officers, the form of uh, corruption is far more deviant and worse, and therefore less tolerable. One would also imagine, therefore, that it would be less shielded by the officers. And perhaps most importantly, the citizens themselves who are victimized by this form of corruption may turn out to be an important ally in our corruption control efforts. In short, we face stings and meat eaters now, isolated from the general, of consult general culture of support in the department, and it's those that have to be the focus of our next round of efforts to improve uh, the control of corruption. I believe that the conclusions that I stated earlier about the right way to deal with corruption now follow from the understanding of this historical context and the contemporary problems. One thing history has taught us is that it is difficult to keep the focus of attention on the problem of corruption and misconduct in a police department. The reasons aren't hard to understand. Police commanders have to ask their troops to do dangerous things in ambiguous contexts. The troops quite reasonably want to know that they'll be backed by their commanders and particularly, perhaps, that they will be backed against false allegations from people whom they view as uh, uh, bad people undeserving of their respect. Given that basic situation, it's hard for police managers to do the things that they should, to probe, to investigate, and to discipline their officers. Yet, police managers also know that officers will use the space they leave open occasionally, intermittently, to do the wrong things. The only way to get the police department managers to feel the courage, to have the courage and have the commitment to ask, to ask their troops to accept the indignity of being investigated and probed is to establish an external agency that expects and demands that of the police management system. In effect, one needs to plug the police department into a source of public concern that will keep sending voltage through the police department's corruption fighting systems. Otherwise, those systems will slacken and fail to produce results. Indeed, as I listened to the testimony today of Commissioners uh, Ward and uh, Kelly, it was clear that at various times, the police department was on the verge of inventing new methods for dealing with corruption. And all that they needed was a little bit of a push to extend another effort in the direction of excellence in producing high-quality, corruption-free policing. And yet, it seemed at a couple of crucial moments, their courage failed them, and they fell back from that challenge rather than pressing ahead and charting out the new frontier that was in front of them. And it's only been the work of this commission that has propelled them forward toward experimentation with additional uh, efforts to invent effective solutions to the problems of today. So that's why I think it's essential that some ongoing external agency be created. There's one other reason why an external agency might be important, uh, and even important to a police commissioner. And that's the reason that I call the boomerang problem, or the problem of the boomerang. In order to control corruption, police officials have to search actively for it. The difficulty, however, is that when they find it, they often discover that they are criticized, and the discovery of corruption is taken as evidence of the failure of the corruption control systems rather than of their continued success. Now, it could be that when they find some forms of corrupt, that some forms of corruption that appear are evidence of uh, weaknesses in the system. I believe that some of the forms of corruption that have been investigated by the Mullen Commission are indications of weaknesses in some aspects of the police department's corruption control system. But it can't be true that every time the police department finds corruption that it is indicative of a problem. Sometimes it is indicative of a solution uh, or the effectiveness of the solutions that the police department has in place. What the public needs, therefore, is some kind of impartial referee to help them understand when the instances of corruption that appear are evidence of success in the police department's corruption fighting system and when it is that they're uh, a failure. It isn't satisfactory to have the police department itself give an answer to that question because they will be unbelievable. We need someone else to tell us about whether the police department's uh, efforts to control corruption uh, are succeeding uh, or failing. So for both those reasons then, to keep the voltage running through the police department, and to warrant the quality and test the quality of the department's 
uh, anti-corruption systems, I believe it's important to create an external audit agency uh, for that purpose. Okay, now let me, let me make another statement, which is that I believe that it is important to preserve and strengthen the principle of command accountability that uh, Commissioner Murphy uh, first established. Even though the PADs have been eliminated, we shouldn't ignore the wisdom and power of the reforms that Murphy makes. You have to distribute the voltage that comes from external pressure widely throughout the department, as well as keep the voltage floor flowing. It is only when the large number of supervisors that um, Commissioner Tyler focused our attention on, the several thousand sergeants, the 1,000 lieutenants, the 300 captains, it's only when all of those take both the formal investigative steps and the informal preventative steps, including simple advice to people that says, don't do it. It's only when all of those people are engaged in the fight against corruption uh, that corruption will stop uh, inside the police department. And the only way to make that happen is to keep some of the feeling of accountability for effective control and some of the means for controlling corruption in the hands of that larger group of uh, officials. Indeed, so that's my second point. The third point I want to make is that the form of corruption that we are now observing ought to be vulnerable to investigation. Therefore, it is important to improve investigation. The reason it ought to be vulnerable to investigation is that there are complainants uh, out there prepared to provide information if only the police department will hear it. This leads me to my fourth and last point, which is to use the basic philosophy of community-oriented policing, which reminds police departments that they must be accountable to citizens both in aggregate and as individuals, as the basis for restoring the capacity of the police department to hear from citizens and having heard from citizens more effectively control the behavior uh, of their officers. In the past, in public sector organizations, we've thought that quality control could be produced in ordinary operations primarily through top-down controls, writing rules and procedures and increasing the number of supervisors, and through a process that we could call defect finding, which is whenever we find a problem uh, we take uh, care of that or we eliminate that particular defect. What private industry has found, however, is that those approaches to uh, producing quality have been less effective than in an alternative approach to producing quality, which has been to concentrate on the cultural values of the department and to put the customer and in a strong position vis-a-vis -vis the organization and make customer satisfaction the touchstone of organizational performance. In effect, peers of, the off of workers and consumers are recruited by top management to help guarantee the quality of the work done by uh, the organization, not just managers and supervisors. My suspicion is that that holds substantial promise for strengthening both the investigative systems and the preventive systems for controlling corruption within the police department. That is, the idea of empowering citizens and taking complaints that come from them seriously may turn out to be the best anti-corruption mechanism at all, of all. So I think the opportunity is here for the department to embrace and the Mullen Commission to help establish a proper form of accountability that can measure and report on the department's efforts to control corruption and serious con misconduct. That would set an industry standard for this generation in the same way that the Knapp Commission uh, investigations and subsequent work uh, set a industry standard in the last generation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Moore. That was a very fine exposition of the alternatives and the objectives which this commission should have, and uh, we will obviously be addressing them. Now, Mr. O'Mayo. I have no further questions of Professor Moore, Your Honor. Any questions, Judge Evans? No, I um, thank uh, you, uh, Professor, for, as the chairman suggested, pointing out um, any number of uh, worthwhile uh, ideas and concepts, all of which um, you, I uh, trust, will help us uh, crystallize. Well, Professor, since you're so accustomed to asking questions of students, I wouldn't want to let you go by without answering some question. So just as a change of pace. Um, 
you made a number of allusions to Commissioner Kelly's uh, approach, some of the things that he's doing. Now, you were sitting here when he made his statement a few minutes ago. Do you have any comments about some of the recommendations, some of the uh, programs that he's attempting to put into place, some of the things he indicated he wishes to do in the future? Uh, um, yes, I'd be willing to make some uh, observations about that. Um, first, I thought that Commissioner Kelly presented a very comprehensive statement uh, describing a variety of different avenues that could be pursued in controlling corruption uh, in the uh, New York City Police Department. And I was particularly interested in the portion of his testimony where he spoke about the need for using aggressive investigative techniques uh, to develop leads and to probe for instances of corruption as well as to follow up existing allegations, both of which I think are uh, uh, terribly important uh, functions that need to get performed. The place where my concerns would arise is on the question uh, of exactly who it is that is accountable for controlling corruption and who has the means to control corruption. Uh, as the, his testimony made clear and his reports have made clear and the questioning made clear, he has tended to focus and concentrate an increasing portion of the investigative activity against corruption in a centralized investigative unit inside the police department. He has done that, I think, it, with the idea of strengthening the quality of the investigative efforts, uh, and in particular, hoping that somehow or other we could get together the allegations of corruption so that we wouldn't have a Dowd situation arise again, that we could bundle up allegations, uh, numerous allegations against the uh, same officer um, and not have them uh, be held uh, separately and apart. It may be that that's the only way to accomplish that important investigative objective. But I suspect that there are other ways of accomplishing that objective as well, particularly in this age of computers and given their investment that they're now making in that. And I think by putting most of the investigative resources and accountability in one office, they are giving up one of the most important instruments that we would have available to us in controlling corruption in the New York City Police Department. Command accountability? Well, the, the command accountability of operational commanders to not only give, com not only pass complaints up the line and not only be good managers, but to do the hardest thing that police commanders can do which is to search for and investigate corruption in their own command. There is nothing that reveals a commander's commitment to controlling integrity more powerfully than the fact that that commander initiated an investigation against people that work for him day in and day out. But well, do you see them as being mutually exclusive? Uh, can they not maintain both standards, namely improved and centralized investigation, and at the same time still repose accountability upon the various commanders? I, what was the key idea in many respects in Murphy's idea of command accountability, which he'll be glad to talk to you about uh, tomorrow, was um, that you had to give, if you were going to give operational commanders the responsibility for rooting out corruption, you also had to provide Best them with the means. Investigative, uh, yes. And the reason that that was important was that then they could take the initiative in conducting an investigation. And the symbolic significance to the organization of an operational commander initiating an investigation for corruption sent a very powerful message throughout the police department that it wasn't just a group off on the side conducting complicated investigations that was against corruption. All right? It was the line operational commander that you saw day in and day out who was against corruption, right? And we all, with all due respect to the centralized investigative uh, agencies and the deterrent power they can generate, it still feels much different to an, uh, an officer if he knows that the line commander that he sees day in and day out has the responsibility and is effectively discharging the responsibility to control corruption. Thank you, Professor. Any other questions? Yes, um as far as a, a, mon a mechanism or an entity to, to do the monitoring, and of course uh, uh, <clears throat> the police commissioner placed a great deal of emphasis on permitting him to continue to function as the chief executive officer yes. of the police department. He didn't want his functions impaired. He didn't want his power diminished. Uh, there are only two models that come to my mind, and I'd like to know if 
you can think of more. I think of a board of directors where the board of directors have two responsibilities, uh, assist, uh, making policy and providing oversight. The other model I think of is the kind of uh, uh, monitoring that's provided, say, by an operation such as the state controller, where the controller sends in his agents, they review all of the management functions, they find the flaws or uh, in them or the malfunctions in, in the management uh, uh, functions, and they write up reports and you have to respond to them. Well, is that the kind of oversight or monitoring entity that we're, uh, we're essentially uh, have uh, to consider? Uh, I think those describe the possibilities. I'm thinking primarily in terms of the second rather than the first, though you could imagine the two being combined uh, in a board of directors with a spe special audit uh, committee that had responsibility for conducting the audits or something like that, or you could just imagine a comptroller. I want to underscore the similarity here because there's a wonderful line in the Philadelphia Police Study Task Force that is talking about the subject of police accountability. And it says, police departments are entrusted with two crucial public resources. One is ma money that is raised from tax revenues and stuff, but the other far more important one is state power. Right? And what is interesting is that we have powerful mechanisms for auditing a police department's performance with respect to the way it uses its money. All right? I think this commission is trying to invent a powerful way of auditing the way that the police department uses this other key resource called state power. And if that could be done, not only would corruption begin to go down, but perhaps abuse of force as well, and, and a new standard would be set for how to hold police departments accountable throughout the country. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned until tomorrow morning at 9.30. Good afternoon.